In our sixth webinar, we cover what are the challenges and opportunities to achieving universal health care in Africa? Africa needs healthy citizens and functional health care systems to achieve its full economic potential. The COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted health care challenges and offers opportunities for the redesign of health care systems across Africa. Rapid population growth, increasing urbanization and diseases of affluence all add urgency to addressing a sector that has been under-resourced both financially and in terms of human capacity for far too long. What lessons have we learned from the pandemic? Are there innovative technological solutions to healthcare and what role should the private sector play? Join us as we expand. Dunning Africa Center. It's not a place, it's a continent-wide conversation. And welcome to the sixth of our Dunning Africa Center webinar series. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to be your host one more time. Uh, I share this honor with a good friend of mine, Dr. Mark Atta. Um, and uh, we have brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, uh, panelists today to discuss this issue at hand. Universal health care, it's a dream. People uh, across Africa, we have been chasing this for years. And of course, now we are looking at the pandemic and we see a varied response across uh, nations within the continent. Uh, and it's you know, it's worth asking us, bringing it to the forefront. You know, Africa, uh, Africa's growth it will be a function of the extent to which we can provide basic infrastructure and health arguably is the core of all infrastructure. You know, you need to have healthy citizens for them to work productively. Uh, from an economic point of view, this is a basic uh, concept. Uh, if uh, I think that it uh, comes before anything else, perhaps arguably the only thing that matters just as much as health is education. So these are the core aspects, the pillars of economic growth and economic development. And it's something that sadly, uh, we see a huge variation in quality across the continent. Also, sadly, um, I think that uh, we can see a huge variation over time. Uh, and uh, there are many countries across the continent that started off very optimistically uh, developing, uh, trying to provide health care, providing at some level of universal health care, uh, only to falter. Uh, and to to fail, uh, and this is in fact where I how I came into this conversation because uh, uh, Mark uh, Atta, uh, one of our panelists today, and Aliko Ahmed, who are also joining us, are in fact friends from undergraduate days, and uh, I spent a lot of time at the medical students hostel, uh, and this was one of the conversations that started more than forty years ago. Now it's very depressing to. To think about how long ago it was, but it's true, it's something in, in that range of time. So, uh, you know, and I think now this is something that whenever we meet socially, the conversation starts. So I thought that this was a perfect opportunity to connect the two together, the business side of the story and, and, and health, which is the driver of almost everything to do with prosperity. So now let me introduce you briefly to our, our brilliant, brilliant speakers. I'm not going to go through their long alphabet, alphabet soup of uh, their biographies. Uh, they're all people of, uh, of, of eminence. Uh, let me start with Mark. Uh, Mark Atta is a, is a general practitioner and a neurosurgeon. Uh, he has been working in various countries, in various uh, systems. He, as I mentioned, he's a former classmate from from Amadou Bello University in Nigeria. Uh, he has an MBA from, uh, from, the, from, in, from England. He has uh, done a number of other qualifications in both business. He's a, he's a successful businessman in his own right. Um, we have uh, with us also uh, Flavia, uh, second, sec, let me pronounce her name, sec, uh, Senko Bugbe. Please tell me, am I doing it right? And uh, uh, Flavia is uh, Deputy Dean at the University of Pretoria, Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, also, many, many, many letters to go after her name. 
It had so many that, as I said to her before we came on, there are more letters after her name than in her name. Uh, <laughs> very impressive CV. Again, I would suggest you have a look at, at, at this. And of course, last but not least, uh, Aliko, Dr. Professor Aliko Ahmed, excuse me, sir. Uh, and uh, Aliko is uh, the Regional Director of Public Health for the East of England region, which is a you know, significant uh, uh, role. And he's, uh, in, you know, he's a global health diplomat uh, and uh, he has been practicing for, again, for more, let's say more than 10 years to be, to, to uh, keep ourselves modest within, uh, not embarrass ourselves with that. Uh, again, there are many, many things I can tell you about him. Associate Director of Cambridge Public Health, Fellow of the Wilson College in Cambridge. Uh, he has a professorship at, at Staffordshire University and at Bayero University, Kano in Nigeria. So without further ado, let me turn to my wonderful panelists and say, okay, let me talk to people who know stuff. I'm just an outsider. I go as a patient most of the time. Um, and now let me ask uh, Mark, uh, what do you want to say something about the current state of Africa's health infrastructure? Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Professor Marula, for, for, for the introduction. Uh, health, they say it's wealth. I think it's not just an adage, it's actually reality. Um, why are we talking about health in a business forum? because you cannot have economic transformation without um, a healthy citizens, healthy workforce. And this is um, underlined by the fact that uh, even right through, and I know in Africa, in most countries, right through the colonial era, health was one of the things that was put in place initially, um, mainly not just altruistic, but to have a healthy world workforce for development. And while we have health, um, we also, you notice that in many countries, most of the major firms would actually offer their staff health insurance. And part of that is to ensure that they have a healthy working scenario. So it's really important as we talk about African business and transforming Africa, that we put health um, in the forefront of our conversation. Now, today we're going to talk about uh, uh, universal health co coverage. This is almost the holy grail of healthcare provision. We know that there are many um, steps that need to be taken. Um, but we really, first of all, would like to start by really taking stock of what the current state is. We know that the COVID pandemic has exposed um, the level of healthcare provision in many countries in Africa. So I think we'd like to start by my fellow panelists who are experts in public health. If you would like to really start by giving us an overview of the current state of healthcare across Africa. Could you maybe start with you, um, Professor Flavia. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Prof. Atta. And, uh, you know, when we talk about the current state, I think we have to have a consideration of a number of elements, and we usually talk about them uh, broadly in terms of the WHO building blocks. Um, first of all, governance, which is how are we leading? And I always like to say that in essence, we have a textured nature. We have health systems that are being very well run as we have seen uh, in terms of the COVID-19 response, some, and some which are absolutely not well run. And um, in, in, in that way, if you, and also if I take the case of South Africa, we have these pockets of excellence um, in specific directions. Um, for, for instance, if you look at our, the, our governance in terms of our national health research system, it's one of the best. And that's why you see we've got some of the top scientists, um, you know, who really are on par with global scientists as well. And so in essence, um, I think even within one country, the issues around governance uh, are actually key. The next piece, of course, of the architecture is information 
transition. Um, and we've seen, uh, particularly during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, the issues around misinformation, the issues around um, inadequate information. And I think uh, the state of health in Africa, particularly, we do know that although we have some areas where we have good information systems, not all of them, you know, are, are, are geared in terms of information systems. And of course, because we are in a uh, business school, I can't leave out the issues around financing and universal Ooh. health coverage being a pivotal piece of that, but in essence, universal health coverage is not the end all and be all in terms of the answer uh, to the health system, but certainly I think funding and financing, you'll find that uh, many of the African health systems are actually run uh, using um, funds that are not uh, from <coughs> the country. And, uh, you know, most of them are donor funded uh, health systems. And so there is a need to talk about that as well. Service delivery, we're going to talk later on maybe about human resources. And certainly I think something that has come to the forefront is the issues around medicine and technologies. And again, we see when we talked about a lot of people talk about vaccine inequity, I like to call it vaccine apartheid, uh, where we saw that in fact in Africa, the issues around medicine and technology and having our own agency to produce our own uh, medicines and ensure that uh, we can give them to our population is something that is very key. So for me, using the health system building block um, of the WHO really creates for you a, a new conversation of how um, the infra, particularly the architecture in, in Africa is doing. And again, as I said, it is very much textured. It's not all bad, it's not all good. And even in just one country like South Africa, uh, you do find the, these differences. Back to you, Mark. Thank you. I'll come back to you. There are some points you have raised that we would kind of try and look at that. Maybe later on we can look and discuss um, areas of excellence, and then we can discuss areas where they need to do better. Um, so, Prof. Aliko, maybe over to you really about the state of health, because I know that you've also been much involved in the Royal Institute of International Affairs here in the UK, that's uh, Chatham House, where you've been involved in the, both the Universal Health Forum and the Global Health Security Forum. So um, what's your take on the current state of um, health in Africa? Well, thank you very much. And um, good evening or is the afternoon for most people. But I'm really delighted to be here. I like the opening around health is wealth because actually without health, there will not be any economic productivity. We like that sort of synergy between the two. So I'm delighted to be here. In terms of the state of affairs now in Africa, particularly when it comes to health, I think for a continent that has been suffering for a very long time, what COVID has done is not only exposed, but exacerbates those sort of health inequalities. We know that Africa as a whole, health outcomes have been worse than most places in the world. The population in the region do not even have access to the basic healthcare services we expect. When you look at life expectancy is one of the lowest in the whole world that we see maternal mortalities are women are dying while giving birth children don't get to their first birthday they don't get to their fifth birthday and still covid came which makes it even worse but what is most concerning for me is that this has been the same story for over three decades most government in Africa don't tend to spend money on the health of their populations. And when you take countries like Nigeria, that has over 200 million people, for example, more than 80 million of that population do not have access to basic health services. This is a country that has the largest economy in the, in the region. And more than 70% of the health spend in that country is coming from people's pockets. So that out-of-pocket spending, I think, is considerable and it's catastrophic. And as my colleague Flavia is saying, financing is quite an important piece of that. But the outcomes is not something that we are proud of. It's something that I hope we can all focus on. And economic development is as important as health development. 
So I think there will be much more look in terms of the trend, what are the underpinning causes, but the state of health in Africa is not good at the moment. Is there optimism in the air? I think so, and I hope so. And hopefully partnership with people around this forum and many more will allow us to see what we can do better. Over to you, Mark. So can I just interrupt for a minute, Mark? And, you know, I think that uh, we are sounding all very serious and we're concerned about, you know, that that health, if health is wealth, we are not particularly wealthy. I think <laughs> is the summary of what we have said here. Uh, so my, my question really then is, the COVID, and as you say, COVID has exposed the limitations in many cases uh, of, uh, um, um, of, of the health systems. Now, I want to ask, let's maybe let's look for, a, for the, the plus side. What are the good things that uh, COVID has exposed? So what, what, what gives you cause for optimism, Aliko? Let, let, let me first throw this to Flavia. Yeah, I mean, as I said, from uh, I'll talk from the South African perspective, the science. I mean, we cannot, um, you know, turn a blind eye on the fact that if you look at, for instance, our scientists in South Africa, they were the first um, in the world uh, to sequence a number of, you know, the COVID-19 uh, 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 genomes that came out and, and we saw the reaction of the international community when the science actually came from Africa. And I think for me, that is the excitement that uh, what COVID-19 exposed, number one is the excellence of our scientists. Number two, to be honest with you, and I think I spoke about this, and I think Aliko and I were on the same panel, where I said, because of our organization in Africa, we didn't see um, the way the, in fact, even developed economies, um, what happened in terms of the sea of people in casualty in hospitals being decimated. Because the reality is that we have a very much a tiered system from district health, community health system, all the way up to a tertiary system. And so we saw how our primary health care actually worked very, very well and people could then access. And we cannot leave out the role of indigenous medicine or traditional uh, medicine, which then came up in the African um, health system when people used their own traditional health uh, medicines, in term, uh, particularly during COVID-19. And so for me, that is something that was very exciting that we didn't see this, you know, prediction, even in every model, uh, you know, predicted that our health systems were going to be decimated by COVID-19. And actually that did not happen. Yes, there are many other variables about our population and that. But for me, the excitement of the fact that our primary healthcare works, especially if I talk about South Africa and many other African countries, is something I, I think which is a cause for celebration. Let me turn this to Mark now. Uh, same question. Uh, well, it's an opportunity. I think that while it exposed it, we did not see the mortalities as, as has been mentioned. But it's also been a wake-up call for us. And remember, unfortunately, remember when Omicron, most of you would remember um, when it came, as Flavia said, was sequenced. And then we got punished for, 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 for having to discover that. That's another issue into the politics of it. But it's also stimulated conversation. I think most progress starts from a conversation. This is part of the conversation. We are now sitting here thinking, hang on, we cannot wait for other people to do this for us. We need to look at our health systems. We need to develop our laboratories. And, and even when you come to the issue of, you said, vaccine equity, we need to begin to develop ours. And maybe that's a good thing that has come out of it, that we can't fall our arms. I think most people are really, most African countries are really beginning to, it's brought health to the forefront of um, many <coughs> countries, including, in, you know, in, in, in Africa, really. I think a lot of them have the profile of health has certainly gone up um, far beyond previous um, um, pandemics, be it Ebola or even the previous 
you know, HIV pandemic. I think this one has it's been a wake up call. So, Aliko, I think this kind of yeah. what I what I'm interested in actually hearing from you is because I know that you are a proponent of the role of connecting health and pharma and you know the connection between these two you know kind of health is not on its own about medical doctors it's also about the whole system and i know you have opinions on this so i'm going to it's a leading question um, yes. <laughs> thank you for that nudge indeed but i must say that the scale and scope of what we have seen that came with covid this devastation was not experienced in africa i completely agree with my two speakers that is a wonderful thing for everybody to realize this rare, the morbidity and mortality we have seen in other Western countries was not experienced in Africa. And that gives a huge amount of insight into what are the assets within Africa. I'm a big proponent of sustainable health improvement in Africa. And I think the answer lies within Africans inherent uh, assets. When you look at Africa's assets, we have pretty young population a large proportion of Africans' population. So there is a demographic dividends that will come out both economically and in health from there. When you also look at some of the things that we don't tend to talk about in Africa that has really helped is that strong social network. Although the regions and the countries in Africa are said to be different, when you look at our commonalities, there are much more similarities than differences. That sense of social support and network has been really helpful. The third one, I think that we don't tend to on the to play quite well, is the resilience of Africans in terms of their hope and going through the psychological safeties are really, really important. And for anybody who has been in infectious diseases or beyond that, they will tell you, you can never really have a sustained epidemiological or virological containment in a country if you don't have a strong ethnographic base, meaning that you have a strong social support, social networks from that. So there are a number of things, and I think the COVID issue has also raised health to the highest level that we've ever seen, as Mark is saying, I completely agree with that. In terms of your leading question, I must say that I've changed. I wasn't like that before. I was a very purist public health person that believe that health is a public good and it is a human right that will be guided and supported and provided by government. For profit has no role to play in that. That was where I belong before. And there are still people who believe in that dichotomy. But I think what I have learned to now understand actually, there are reasonable partnership that can come. When you look in a continent where, as I said, 70% of the health spend is coming from people's out of pocket, where government are spending less than 0.5% of their GDP on health, it is really, really worrying to assume that government would immediately do everything. So there is a whole society approach. That means government, private sector, civil society all come together to play a part in addressing the challenges. And I now believe that with the right environment, private sector can play a strong partnership in helping to address the health challenges in Africa. Although there are some conditions that I think are needed in place. When you look at the places like Nigeria recently, a review shows that despite the huge amount of private provision that exists there, the quality of provision is really, really fragmented. It's not up to scratch. So while I support the idea of partnership, I think there are certain imperatives that needs to be in place in order for private sector to do what is right for the public good. Well, I think we are really come on to, I think, the, the crux of the matter here. So what I'm picking up is, first of all, that you have clearly had a moment, an epiphany, um, you know, um, uh, Quovad is, you know, uh, if you have any, you know, any biblical you know, sense, there's a point when, uh, anyway, we'll not go there. This is not a Bible lesson, but there's a moment of of of, of uh, epiphany which you have struck you, which I would love to hear about. But let's let, come to explore this a little bit. Maybe, maybe I, 
I think yeah. we need to slow down a bit. Actually, he's raised two important points yes. that I think are worth exploring okay. because I think that's going to be the foundation of you know, how we take health forward in Africa. The first question, and I think it's useful for the population and politicians is, you've touched on, is health a right or a privilege? Is it a fundamental human right? I really want to hear, you know, from the panel and from every, you know, just what people's thoughts are, because we need to have clarity on that discussion before we even talk about so what is the role of the state? And then we can go to the role of, you know, other agencies, private, and which I'm really keen to hear, um, role of businesses for profits, donors, other parts. But I think we need those two questions. Is health a fundamental human right? And then maybe what's the role of the state? So maybe let's take on that before we proceed. Yeah. yeah, maybe I can come in. I mean, you know, we've one thing that COVID has shown, and I think for us who've been in public health for many years, we've been shouting from the rooftops that without health, there's nothing. You can talk about developmental agendas or anything like that. In every single thing we do, whatever model, whatever framework, people are at the center of it. Any business, any industry cannot work without having people. So in my mind, I think health, that's why health is a fundamental um, human right. And what is the responsibility of government? As crazy and weird as this may sound, number one is to care. Because you see, if you have a caring um, leader, they then will recognize and 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 the pain and the suffering of their population will matter. And if it then matters, you will then see those line items coming out. It was very interesting for me this week. Uh, we it was the um, African um, regulators conference. All the regulators in the, the entire Africa gathered in South Africa. And one of the speakers said something that was just interesting to me. He said, and he was high up in government, and I won't say with which country, that in that particular country, they had seven ventilators in the entire country. When COVID hit, remember in the first early days, we were talking about ventilators. And he said, because it was, everything was locked down, and then the ministers and the politicians could not go out for medical tourism. He said in one week, they ordered 27 new ventilators. And they had had all these years, only seven ventilators. So that they took their number up and now they have 40 ventilators in the entire country. What does that mean? It goes back to what I was saying, caring. If you care and it touches you, you will, where did that money come from? That means that the, the money must have been sold somewhere. So I'm not a proponent of saying that, you know, African countries cannot fund health. They can fund health if they really care, I think, about their population. And that's why, for me, it is a fundamental human right. So, no, the, I think the question is not whether, it's, uh, if I may interrupt here, Mark, so the question is not whether it's a fundamental human right. I think nobody will tell you that, no. Uh, this is not we're not living in America. This is not I doubt anyone in this room will say uh, we are, you know, you're on your own. But what I th think the point that Flavia is bringing up very nicely is that, to be honest, we have what we call government failure. OK, they have we have inefficient governments. We have inefficient is a polite word in many ways. Uh, some worse than others, where the priorities are simply not there. You know, uh, they can fly, as you say, fly off to Germany uh, as un un unnamed presidents in, in Africa do on a regular basis uh, for treatment uh, and they leave the rest of them to, to manage on their own. So I think that's not really a question. The question is that if you assume gov governments are failing, how do we move forward? I think this is really a more practical issue. Assuming that we have inefficient government, and there's no reason to believe they're going to get efficient in the near future. I know, I'm, you know there are exceptions, obviously, but uh, obviously I'm thinking about Nigeria. Uh, I'm not going to wake up to a Nigeria where suddenly everything, everything is efficient again, at least not in the next one or two years. 
So let me put it put it this way to Aliko, uh, who is uh, less uh, less of a dreamer than Mark. <laughs> what do we do if we have an inefficient government? I think it's a very realistic question, Prof, because I think to assume government will move from a position when they are spending zero point less than zero point five percent of their GDP on health to sort of a position when they will be sort of spending fifteen percent of it. It's unrealistic at the moment. Maybe it's a gradual journey. And I think most governments will be able to do it. But even efficiency, lack of political motivation is one of the key issues. And how can they get to do that? I think that's why we think health is political in as much as anything. Because when you have the political will, I think there is the likelihood that people can succeed in doing that. But Driving that political will means also being realistic with what resources people have, how they can go into partnership with that. There was an example from one of the big cities in Nigeria when you take Lagos, for example. The current government in Lagos are quite attuned to this view of wanting to provide basic health care services, but they need to generate the funding resources to do that. And while they have a huge amount of budget, the budget, they are, if you look at the GDP and the tax to GDP ratio, it's very small, it's 6%. Almost 80% of their businesses are SMEs, and they are not pulling any tax from there. So the question is then, how can they generate enough funding to provide the basic health care fund? So this is why they are now thinking in a more advanced partnership way where private sector comes. And private sector will work with them within the right regulatory framework, within the right sort of ways of re uh, pooling resources, risk pooling, and within the right sort of environment whereby you can improve quality to see how they can fund healthcare and provide it together. As I said, in Nigeria, private sector by and large do provide a huge amount of care. Is the funding element of it that probably is lacking what everybody expects government to do. And that's why the government inefficiency comes. So I think we are seeing increasing interest in private sector coming in. One of the most advanced hospitals now in Africa, certainly in Nigeria, the Duchess Hospital, was a private public partnership. They were able to raise capital from the central bank and now they have had a system there where medical tourism is absolutely minimizing the country. You may be aware the vice president of the country has a recent incident. Typically, he would have been flown to Germany or Europe to, for treatment. And he did not. He went to that hospital. So while it's still an elitist access to that, it is beginning to be in the right direction. People don't have to go anywhere and private sector are part and parcel of that. So I don't know Prop, whether that is the kind of example that might make sense in terms of how we shift from uh, Mark, where we Mark are. is dying to say something. So I'm going to let Mark uh, jump well, in I'm, here. I'm, 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 I'm not being um, unrealistic. I think it's a journey. And I think yeah. that like Aliko said, before we get there, they've got to be partnerships. I've got to say that, um, and this is why I mentioned not just private sector, also donors. I'm not in any way saying that, um, you know, private sectors have no role. If you remember, like I said earlier on, going back to history, a lot of the health that was provided and in earlier times um, were from actually organizations like mission organizations and so on. And that's the foundation of health in many African countries. Those were not free, but at least they stood as a bridge. They were affordable. And I think in many countries subsequently, those were subsidized. So I'm not in any way saying we should all have. I think when you look at health, there's provision at different levels. There's yeah. primary care, you know, secondary care, tertiary specialist. But that brings my fundamental question. And one of the issues about government, why I deliberately ask that question is, what's the responsibility of government? 
it could be just, are they just an enabling environment? Are they going to contribute funding? Part, what percentage? We have the Abuja declaration, the 15%, which sadly, even Nigeria, where Abuja, where it was done, mm -hmm. does not contribute to that. But a lot of some other African countries making progress towards yeah. that amount of contribution. So before you talk about their ambition, what is their role and how are they supporting the partnership? And what's the donor role? Because we talked about donors and I said it would be really useful to talk about that. Is mm -hmm. that making African countries to abdicate some of their responsibilities? Yeah. I'll throw it there. Okay, so first but of all, I also I... think that um, I also there is another question, Mark, that you haven't asked, and it's the role of the, the the people, the citizens. I mean, if I give an example of South Africa during our AIDS denialism time, it was actually the civil society um, groupings that pushed, um, you know, for uh, antiretrovirals to be in the country. So I think the role of ensuring that we don't have passive citizens as well, in order to push governments to get, um, you know, this notion that health is our human right, I think is very important. But you have to teach, um, you know, the citizens to be active participants through um, civil society, you know, formation of civil society groupings that will be heard, you know. And I, I think we shouldn't run away as well from um, the reality, as much as it is difficult, that we should elect the leaders that we want. And we have to have a mechanism that if we're not getting what we want um, in Africa, we should be able to, you know, have a mechanism again through citizen action um, of electing the people that we want because for so long we've been like oh this person has been in that position um, for a very long time we'll get what we get and we re-elect them over and over again and I think the role of the leaders um, and the kind of leaders that we want is also something important but for me I just wanted to really add the element of the citizens as well just taking that case study and that lens of South Africa and ARV. So, you know, one thing, Flavia, that I think, you know, South Africa is, a, is in some ways a special case. You have uh, parts of the, you know, you, you have still have the division of the country in a sense, an apartheid style thing where you have a first world, uh, parts of the country are first world and parts of the country are third world. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I don't have to explain this to you. Uh, uh, but uh, so how does that play into this problem? Uh, how does how does South Africa handle this problem of having people uh, on both sides of the divide, as it were? Yeah, I mean, it is just so true what you are saying. And I think um, when, so when we started off in South Africa, in order to merge the two health system, we had the white paper on transformation of health services in the country. But what we didn't realize then is how difficult it was going to be. And so invariably, we have this dual uh, system of the private and the public, and certainly the private sector, you really get um, first class treatment. And as you say, not everybody uh, can can afford that. And I think the driver then, you actually see it, as I say, in the numbers. So um, for instance, um, Aliko and Mark both talk, talked about maternal mortality rate, infant mortality rate. And in South Africa, you see um, pockets, particularly in the government sector where people don't have access, those numbers which are, you know, similar to what we have in other African countries. And then in the private sector, you don't have that. And I think, again, going back to Mark's question, the role of government is regulation. Um, and so you will see, for instance, we, we've we just um, uh, now for a couple of years had what we call the Office of Standards of Health Compliance. And that particular office is, you know, trying to see, are we actually compliant, you know, in terms of the health system and trying to bridge the gaps in compliance. But what will shock you as well is that even within the government system, some of the best 
um, healthcare in South Africa, you find that there, for instance, if I take our hospital, Steve Bigo Academic Hospital, um, that, that is the training platform for um, the University of Pretoria, we just received an international award for the best stroke uh, management. And I mean, it's, it's, the, it's absolutely incredible. And we've got the best nuclear medicine, um, you know, kind of facility uh, in Africa. And I think Cape Town as well with the uh, cardiology. So you, the, the, the issue is, again, as I said, that texturedness, because not everybody has got access to it. And that's when you see all these numbers. And I think I don't really have an answer in terms of how we bridge that at this point in time. But I think the one thing is to be very intentional about the policies, number one, and two, where that funding goes to. Because you will see that a lot of our funding, again, is still, um, you know, within the private sector. But I think certainly uh, there, there is a need to up that funding uh, for the government sector as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm aware that questions are popping up now on the screen. But just before we start taking questions, I want to combine Mark's comment and, and Flavius' comment. So there are two questions here. Where is the money coming from and where is the money going to? Uh, Mark is asking about donors. Uh, but uh, Flavia is asking, where is the money going to? And I think this is actually kind of a flow problem. Uh, we first need to have the, the money coming in from somewhere, and then we have to make sure that the money goes to the right purposes, to where it's needed geographically, to what demographic in society, and so on. Am I, am I oversimplifying as a business type person, or am I, am I making sense? Aliko? Uh, we don't. We we expect that there will be some sort of equation of supply and demand when you are involved. I can't help myself. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 that, that that I think is fine because I think that's the role of government as well. I think Mark raised the question about the role of government. I completely believe the role of government is the right to live and the right to have a life that is decent. That may involve creating and enabling environment through like grade three processes or it can be even to provision so where i'm sitting right now in the uk the role of government is to ensure there is provision of healthcare services for all its citizens where you are sitting in south africa is probably slightly different in terms of that so that's i think the texas nature and within africa we have seen different models like that but i personally think that Funding is an important issue. How do you raise that funding in order to do to provide that, especially when you are looking at it from that public good? I have a worry about donor dependency. I think that to me is the biggest problem for Africa. And that is something that I wish one day there will be a complete transition away from donors. Because yes, some good things have happened to Africa because of donors. But a huge amount also that hasn't worked well has happened because of donors. So I think that dependency is not something that is good for Africa. Africa has increasingly having people that have billions that can do donation within there without those sort of strict vertical ways of distorting and making our health services go in a way that probably is not the best. So I have different views for donors, and I think the world of donation is coming to a transition as well. We're seeing exit at that. So some sustainable approaches will have to be found. Mark. Yeah, I, I, I think before we go on, I don't know whether we'll take the questions because yes. there's one that is quite useful, a comment here in the comment box. So do we need an African context specific model? that is different from other parts of the world, bearing in mind the level of resilience, immunity, and people, absolutely. And I think this nicely moves on. We've got strengths. I think one of the things I don't want us to do when we talk you know, in Africa is to be all doom and gloom. There are opportunities here too, opportunities to innovate. And we, we've got strength. You know, Flavius talks about the sequencing in South Africa we tend to forget the role that laboratories like in Dakar, Senegal, the Pasteur Laboratory, you know, have been able to make some of these diagnostic kits, even right from Ebola time, that are much cheaper, easier to use. So there are those trends. So we will look at that. When you talk of context specific, 
I'll just make a comment really about how we even deliver care in Africa, which is, if you look at the hospital design, which I've also got an issue with that because most politicians think health is about big shiny hospitals actually, which I know it brings votes, but it's got its problem. But let's look at hospital designs. The resilience we talk about, Africans, we are very family friendly people. We look after our own. We talked about some of those things that were. However, it's interesting. I've seen hospitals designed in, in many countries in Africa. I'm yet to see a, 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 the one. Where is the typical Western style? Where is the provision for families to live nearby, to be able to cook and do things, which is what happens. This is what I'm trying to say, trying to get context specific. But I think more importantly, we really need to think about even the delivery, you know, your rationalist funding in and out, the traditional model with the cost of healthcare cannot solve the massive um, problems we have. Is this room for innovation? Are we going to step up innovation, for instance, in telehealth? And I know there are good examples of that. I know some companies in you know, you know, Uganda, we have recently one of the CEOs who was interviewed on CNN. This is what we want to see. We cannot have, say, a doctor in every village in Africa. That's not practical. But how do we make a doctor available to them? Those are what we can think. I keep saying that in the telecoms revolution, Africa bypassed the landlines, you know, the copper lines for telephones straight into the mobile era. Can we do that for health and in many other areas where we can improve our health? I'll leave it out there. You know, we've got entrepreneurs and businesses, huge opportunities. I, I, think I want this... to borrow a little bit from Aliko's book. You know, Aliko is always so sober-minded about things. And the reality is that, um, you know, in Africa, at, at our current state is that we do need um, donor funding. Um, but I do believe that if we're going to get donor funding, the, um, the donors are not the ones who are supposed to set the agenda. We should have our own strategies. And then we say, okay, we need funding for line A, line B, the line see on our strategy. And I mean, if I can give an example, when I was um, in one of my jobs, when I was um, the public health specialist for one of the districts, you, um, for one of the cities, in one district, we actually had five donors and coming back to Mark and the indigenization of the health system. And in that district, there were all these five donors were going to be working on orphaned and vulnerable children in one district, five donors. And then they, the way it got to my office is because they were quarreling about, you know, the slice of the pie. And then I said to them, but if I, if I roll back and tell you, what if I tell you in Africa, we don't have any orphaned and vulnerable child. If I, as Flavia, they tell me, no, my people come from Lagos in Nigeria and uh, I've been living in London all my life. I can go and they'll say, whose child are you? They say, Senkubuge. whoever says, I remember your grandfather, that, that is my family. And they have to take me in because I am their child. And so maybe again, going back to what Mark is saying, is our, fund, uh, our funding model incorrect? So should we not be funding Gogo Matlangu to take care of the neighbor's uh, uh, children because they've been orphaned instead of creating these homes, which are very artificial and superficial um, in Africa? And so I think that for me, because our, you know, our governments are not there yet in terms of funding everything, and we're still going to have donors, the most important thing is that they must fund our strategy, and because that they must not be the ones who are driving the health agenda in Africa, we must be the ones to drive that health agenda. I think the one of the kind of the the precondition for that to happen, I, I you know I agree with your point. I think that is that that there must be a plan. A credible plan, and a lot of times I've I've seen this uh, um, in in various governments that they say we want to do it. Uh, no, we want to tell donors what to do, but you don't have a plan in which to direct them to do it. So you you resent the fact that they tell you what to do with the money, yet you are not offering them any clear guidance 
in, in intelligent guidance and firmly saying this is what we plan to do. Rather, where is the money? We find a way of using it. Uh, we have uh, Salamatu Isa in the audience, who is an advisor to the Katrina State Government uh, on a number of uh, these issues. And uh, so I, I, I see that she's uh, following the conversation. Also formerly, by the way, the head of Department of Economics at Amadou Bello. Uh, so we, ha we have people who are actually in the process of implementing uh, or have the capacity to implement some of these things. So we pick our words carefully. And we are ho hopefully going to have some small Delta X effect on, uh, on policy making, at least in Kaduna State. I think a couple of questions come up here, which uh, I think uh, Charlie Stevens, uh, um, he brings up the issue uh, of uh, funding and technological innovations uh, coming from the private sector. Uh, is um, uh, uh, They have the potential to disrupt and transform healthcare. This kind of connects nicely to, to Mark's point about telemedicine as well, but perhaps more broadly, uh, and I, I have to say the telemedicine idea is very appealing in some ways, at least for simple dispensary type, you know, uh, stuff that uh, very often, you know, I, I know that there was such a, some, you know, as, as you know, you may remember uh, back in the day, there were many of the, of the small town just had a nurse uh, and 90% of stuff was handled by a nurse rather than by actually a, uh, a practitioner and of course we couldn't call but now you can pick up the phone in fact I do this now I haven't seen my GP in three years since the COVID uh, pandemic you send a picture of that of your foot or whatever is necessary to be examined and the the GP tells you what to do uh, maybe this is the future uh, Mark uh, what where do you see stand on this yeah I mean innovation. innovation yes I think that innovation is not just some of those technologies but even the way we deliver I'll tell you a story. In 2000 and in 2011, I was going to Malawi, you know, kind of on a health mission. Part of it was to kind of look at some of the systems. And I think that was when they just brought one of the reports about in those days, it was still the Millennium Development Goals, you know, there were still the MDGs. And Malawi was one of the countries that made um, progress in their maternal mortality. Um, unlike other countries, actually countries that they thought like India was, was a disappointment. So when I went to, to uh, Malawi, one of the things I really had in mind was to really find out how did they do it. And one of the things I found out was that it was a very simple measure, for instance, instead of pregnant women who were having problems to be transported try to find their way. They had tried other solutions. I went in front of the minister's office and there was this huge pile of, 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 of carriages that looked like open coffins, really, which they tied to bicycle. They had spent a lot of donor money that people would bicycle them from villages to the nearest health facility, which didn't work. So there was a huge pile in front of the health minister's office. But what they did subsequently which is one of the simple innovations was they then decided that they would have, rather than have that, even in the most remote village, they will have that without mobile phone, they will have walkie talkies, a district hospital will be there where there were ambulances. So that you just notify the district hospital and then the district hospital will actually send that ambulance to the most remote area and retrieve the woman, it was just a change of thinking from actually allowing, trying to get the woman there. It was just a little bit of change to allow actually retrieving women. I think that had a massive impact. So it is little things like this, sometimes not the big things, changing processes that actually will have an impact. And I saw, and I also, another example was in one of the states in Nigeria, on those states, I was speaking to one of the delegations there. What were they doing? They all had a record system where all the midwives, they gave all the pregnant women a simple mobile phone that they could call a midwife once they were in distress. 
and actually they could see improvement. So we really need to think beyond that. So that's at a simple level. But at another level, there are lots of things in technology we really need to think about that we can do the African way. Like we said, if we have relatives helping to care, will that cost reduce our cost of, 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 of establishing care, even in hospitals or primary healthcare centers? Are there other things we can do um, that would help? Can we adapt some of the technologies that we can use or some of the equipment that we can use and, 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 and for, for other things? So these are the things we need to think about, actually. You know, we really need to really design every process and question because everything we do, we really just kind of try and bring it or the way they do it um, in, the, in the West. So there are rooms for us to think, we have solutions to our problems, we can do it our own way, but I think we need to harness that and we need to create the right environment to allow people to, to be able to do that. So one of the, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a tendency, of course, in the West to see the, to think in more high tech in terms of uh, pharma providing, having local production of vaccines, having uh, more, uh, you know, kind of engaging in, in the, more the high tech approach. In fact, Klaus uh, is Klaus Meyer, who is on a colleague of mine from Canada, is saying, uh, should African national health systems import medication and vaccines from India or should they build local pharma manufacturing sites? Uh, if you want to localize, what are the main barriers to building manufacturing capacity? Is this an issue? Is this something we should be focusing our energy on, given the, the goal, the ultimate goal of universal health care? Or is this uh, a distraction from the big issues? Let's start with Aliko. It's certainly not a distraction, not at all. I think if there is anything that came out of this COVID, it's precisely that. We've seen what um, has been called vaccine appetite or vaccine inequity, however you call it. That has really, really raised African thinking about the need to think about pharmaceuticals in a different way. The African Union and the Africa CDC have launched something called the New Public Health Order. And within it has a huge opportunity of creating pharmaceuticals capabilities within Africa, starting with vaccine production. I think we all know some of the problems with industry and businesses with health, which has some of the negativity, was some of the issues that we have learned around how much do industry put investment towards diseases that are seen to be more of African interest compared to diseases that will have an areas in Western Europe where you can make more money. So investment in research and development, whether in medication or drugs have been an issue. That's why we have this huge group of diseases that we call the neglected <laughs> tropical diseases that nobody wants to do anything about it because there isn't money. So I think in terms of the positivity, as uh, Mark and uh, Plavia highlighted, out of COVID now, there is that a new sense of Africanism over the independence in terms of pharmaceuticals and medication. And it all comes down to the issues of intellectual property rights as well. And I'm glad to see that WTO are getting their hands into that. And we expect a little bit more with the Nigerian now being the DG in that. So I think that's one huge area. And coming back just quickly on that innovation prop, because I think Mark raises a good point. And I see innovation to me as not purely copying what is happening in the West, but also innovating some of the assets that we have in our society. I still think there are a lot of assets that we have within our own culture that over time we have been told or brainwashed to think that are negative. They are actually health promoting in a lot of sense. And I think a revisit into those fundamental social cultural assets we have can be quite health promoting. Take, for example, when it comes to funding, I think Mark talked about missionaries. By and by nature, most African will identify with one religion or the other. There are some high level of religiosity. 
And when you take the major religions like Islam or you look at Christianity, all of them are fundamentally pro poor. Either you give some sort of contribution of your money to the church or you give some contribution of your money to the mosque or to Muslims in terms of the zakat. To me, that allows another funding resource that can be pulled into some sort of big funding mechanism that can be harnessed to provide better care to the people. The last one on that innovation as well. I think when you look at the mobile phone, which I think is one of the success stories in Africa in terms of communication, Rob, you touch about the provision aspect of it. Yes, it can enhance healthcare provision, but it can also be a source of healthcare funding. We talk about the telecom task. In Nigeria, I think, have been talking about it for some time. I don't know whether other African countries have done it. When you put a small tax on each call you make that goes into health, people will not only not mind giving that money because they know it relates to something that they can benefit from. But that's another big way that you can create funding sources and enhance provision through innovation. I will stop there, Prof. To no, give that's other. a brilliant point. I, I think there are a couple of things. Uh, before I ask um, uh, Flavia to join in, I want to comment on the IPR issue, which uh, you are incredibly optimistic about. Uh, and uh, I am not, uh, regardless not of who is in charge of the WTO. I'm an optimist, bro. <laughs> can, I, can I quickly chip in a very important point, which is a real fashion of mine that, um, um, that Aliko has mentioned, really. It's about, this is the role of um, religious organizations. I have often said in many countries, when we talk about, because it seems, if you look at the history of the NHS, started from local insurance or whatever, local contributions, which were good in Africa. There has been a pilot in Zambia where they've used faith-based organizations as the people administering that. So your local church or, or mosque, you make a contribution there. They know the poor people, they have a pool of money, and they use it as an insurance. When somebody is admitted to hospital, they use that contribution to pay for that individual. I think that's one area of funding that we have not explored much in Africa, you know, so. So instead of bribing, bri buying private jet for uh, our imams and our pre preachers, uh, they should put the money into healthcare, which would be an ideal thing. Uh, solution, I think. Um, and I think, so innovative ways of funding, this is where coming into the input part of it, innovative ways of funding. Um, and the, of course, but the thing we have not brought up right yet is the insurance side of the story. Because yes. clearly, that is something that even, even in the rich countries, uh, states cannot provide, as we are finding out in the UK. The yeah. NHS model cannot continue to survive unless there's another way of funding it that doesn't require taxes. Uh, and taxes, of course, is a huge issue in almost every uh, developing uh, country. Uh, uh, and we don't need to go into example of that. So, so, but Flavia, I think South Africa is perhaps in many ways uh, has already come to this point of talking about in, where does the role of insurance come in? Uh, and perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. Yes, now in South Africa, we're talking about the national health insurance. And of course, um, ours is unique, particularly, as you said, um, Prof Narula, uh, with our uh, dual system and all those different layers um, of um, our mixed economy. And, and so in South Africa, one of the things that is um, uh, going to be a feature of the national health insurance is recognizing that healthcare is not only provided at the quaternary or, or tertiary level. And I think that hospice centric model is something that I think is a is, is something that we inherited long, long. And this is why a lot of colleagues are talking about decolonizing the health system. And so our national health insurance is actually being built from ground up. And so it's got features of 
um, a social health system in a way um, and, and, and features then of similar to what you have in the UK of um, an NHS. So we are going to be having a mixed model where you can, again, I go back to maybe it's my inclinage as, as a public health physician of the different layers that you can get access um, quality health care from, um, you know, the primary health care, also the district, and then um, up to the, the quaternary and tertiary level. So I think those are the features that, in and, and also then trying to bridge, as I said, our um, divide of the duality, we will be contracting in, for instance, general practitioners, and they will be able to see somebody like a Gogo Matlangu from the village who will be able um, to see their general practitioner who they traditionally wouldn't have been able to see because that um, general practitioner would be contracted in to take care of that number of households. The other thing which is maybe of interest to this audience is the certificate of need that now in terms of you know, what we're talking about is that in terms of not having that disparity, so you'll find a city like Pretoria or Johannesburg, every second, um, you know, practice, there's a general practitioner, in fact, even a specialist, yet in some provinces, you'll only find, let's say, one ENT surgeon or, you know, no cardiologist and that. So now, in order for you to open, um, you know, a private practice, they, there would be a need for you to apply for a certificate of need and say, okay, but we've got too many cardiologists in this area, would you consider moving to another area in terms of so that we don't have that disparity? While I have the microphone, I also want to answer Roland uh, Maposa's question about the, whether there is a health agency. And as I said, in fact, there is um, something that is called the Association of Medical Councils of Africa. And if we are going to be able to standardize healthcare, it has to start from the um, you know, from the regulators. And so in a way, it's really exciting in Africa that all the African regulators have come together and they, they have three agenda items. The first one, um, of course, is what I was talking about in terms of um, ensuring that there is a commonality in our, in our health systems and also what we are teaching. So if I'm a doctor in South Africa and I want to go in Uganda or, and work there in Uganda, they shouldn't be a problem. You know, they should be that harmonization of our curriculums. And then the second one is, again, the decolonizing of the health system to build a typically um, African infrastructure that is there. And I think the third one is quite sobering to say, let's start already with, it, with our economic <coughs> block and say within the SADC region, how are we going to harmonize um, our healthcare? For instance, now in the SADC region, there's a talk of having, for instance, a common road to health chart, which is the chart you know, that um, monitors um, children and childbirth and when you go for antenatal care. And so um, Roland, so there is that agency. And I think um, for this audience, it will be interesting. And it's abbreviation uh, in South Africa. And I think in Africa, we're like abbreviations, it's um, COA, the African Medical Council of um, you know, African Regulators. Thanks, over. Well, that's why, you know, in fact, uh, Mark will tell you, as a, as a fellow of the West African College of Surgeons, uh, <laughs> that these things existed uh, once upon a time uh, in regional level. Mark. Yeah. It, no, it's still happening. Afri Actually, West Africa has had um, the West African Health Community for quite a while really. And they standardized, they started with standardizing postgraduate medical training, which I, I, I went through that training. It initially, I remember when during my time, it was mainly the Anglophone West African countries, you know, Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, Liberia. But I'm pleased, very pleased and surprisingly pleasant surprise that the Francophone countries have joined in Actually, the college, of, you know, they also have the college, public health, medicine, every, you know, different specialties. And, and, and so there is a universal kind of certification for postgraduate medical training in West Africa. Um, I think we probably it will be helpful to get through some of the comments and questions so yeah. that people don't think we're ignoring before we run out of time. We've still got some things we need to so, talk about, you know. 
Um, you would the, one of the burning questions that keeps coming up in the chat is about traditional healers. Now, yes. I, I, I want, I, so again, as a lay person, my, my thought is that uh, if, we, if we're going to allow traditional healers, one has to remember there are they're, they're shysters out there. Um, and um, uh, the, maybe there is a process of, uh, of standardization and training and certification that might be necessary to, to streamline this. But anyway, let's start again with, uh, with Flavia and, uh, and uh, on this particular point. What do you think? Traditional healing. And, uh... Yeah, I mean, in South Africa, by the way, we've already started in our, um, you know, in the, in, in the medical, um, in, in the Health Professions Council of South Africa, this was one point which is on our table and in our agenda. And in fact, even with the WHO, there's already a draft paper, and I think it may be even um, have been tabled at this regional committee meeting um, on traditional healers. I think there is a need for them, but I think they have to be well regulated. And in South Africa, um, in one of our sister units, universities, which is called University of KwaZulu-Natal. They have amazing work that they are doing in terms of standardizing the treatment for traditional healers. Uh, Mark. Well, there, there, there are certain things, I think there are issues here. One of the shortcomings of the way we have imported medicine, and I think was it Flavia mentioned about decolonizing the training, is that the standard medical care we provide in hospitals, um, we have tend to lose the, our humanity. That's my first comment. The traditional healers are the ones with the empathy, they sit down with those people. You know, it's not just the tech and medication, there are many aspects to health. They tend to provide that, you know, they know them, they know. So, it's not a question of, yes, some of the treatments are useful, some are not. And the difficulty, we've talked a lot about regulation, is in knowing which of those are useful, which are not. I'm sad to say that there, in some cases, they have um, done some harm, some they have been helpful. But what do you do when people don't have anything at all? I will have love in a place where we have provision in everywhere, then we might not need them. One of the areas, for instance, the traditional birth attendance, I remember there was a long debate, um, I think in the Lancet, this is many years ago, over 20 years ago, between Professor Kersley Harrison, who was an obstetrician in, in, um, in, in Port Harcourt, in Nigeria, who was pro, and I couldn't remember the other person who was, there was quite a debate actually on, on in, you know, in the Lancet. So it's a raging debate. We have to do it carefully, but we don't stop them. Should we incorporate them? Um, what level do they know? And would somebody just not just wake up and say he's a traditional healer from their village without having any training? Who are the good ones? Who are the not so good ones? It's a complex thing, but I would like to look at this debate rather. The question is, we have a huge potential of our vast remedies um, that we haven't documented, we haven't researched. I think that's the area now that we're talking about that we need to look at. And, and some of the people that have knowledge, I was just looking at, you know, in Gabon and um, Central Africa, um, oh. one of the routes they have that has been exploited now, um, the Iboga plant, which has Ibogaine, which it's a psychostimulant. People say it's used for treating addiction, lots of psychological problems, very little research at all. And I think there are lots and lots of things that we have. So I'll look at it from that. But in terms of provision, if I go to a village in the remote part, there is no problem, no health worker at all. What do you do? Do you support them? Do you fund them? It's the only woman, you know, the go go as you know, Flavia would say in South Africa, who takes deliveries. And there are many parts of Africa like that. 
some systems have supported them, giving them clean razors to stop tetanus, giving them kind of tactics. Um, as we say, we're in a halfway solution to our kind of ultimate goal. So sometimes um, I think it's the, the jury is out, you know. I think we've just, we, we've just got to be careful the way we use them. Can I come in here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I think sometimes some of this debate is sort of, unfortunately, the product of our colonial thinking of Western medicine is always the best. And we just think that's the right solution. Unfortunately, I, I, I personally think when we're talking about African context, this is where assets have to be what we have plus what others have had, which is the West needs to combine. I, I look at this in two ways. You know, there is a need, which is your ability to benefit. And there is also the demand, which is the skills around your capacity to help. Traditionally, uh, uh, traditional healers have been fundamental to African healthcare for a long, long, long time. And yes, there might be some harm for some, but they're actually a lot more good than harm. I think a system that combines an approach that brings the Western medicine approach and the traditional healers is helpful. And most of them actually are providing the most basic care that people need in places. And we have seen the traditional fat attendants being brought into formal healthcare system with little integration and little training. There was actually cross learning between the Western midwifery approaches and the traditional midwifery and outcomes become better in this environment where they are. So I don't think it's something that we should ditch. We should bring them in into sort of the way we are thinking, combine the two set of things and improve their own yes. health care. We are talking in a continent now where only 1% of the world health workforce exists, while we have almost 10% of the world population. So we can't make everybody to be Western doctor or nursing. We need to tap into what we got and improve them. And they are good skills that provide holistic care. And we should work with that. I think that uh, I know I, I am a bit more cautious because I, I have a very vivid memory as a, as a, as a child of, of watching a, someone in my class having his uh, you know, blood drained by a traditional healer who was trying to get rid of malaria. And this child got, you know, it, it, was, it was not a nice sight to come in and you, you know, have these, you know, where they, they will cut and they will drain the, the drain blood using a rusty knife. Um, and he had to go into, they had to take him into a hospital eventually because he had sepsis as a result of uh, all of that uh, draining. So I'm a little bit cautious about this, but I do see your point. But I think this brings me, brings us to the issue, the supply side issue of, of, the training of doctors, the training of medical health professionals. And, you know, this, this, uh, this, this debate session consists of three people living in the diaspora, i.e. brain drain. Uh, Aliko, Mark and myself have had uh, free education from the times when Nigeria had free education. And none of us is, is contributing anything to the economy which trained us. Um, now, brain drain. This is our, uh, our issue, really, that uh, that is that is very very current. Given that the British government are paying good money to to attract people from across uh, Anglophone Africa to come and work in the UK now. Uh, let's start with Mark on this point. Well, I have to declare conflict of interest here because um, <laughs> probably one of those that have been drained. But it all comes down to organization, really. And I think that I know in their countries in Africa where um, doctors are looking for jobs, you might think it's this thing, it's time um, this thing, but it's paradoxical. I know that, for instance, in Nigeria, to do a house job, there is a waiting list of anything between six months and two years. And there is also, I'm not trying to defend it, but there is also um, a, a question of how the health services are run, what are the facilities there, and there's a lot of underemployment actually. And a system, in some of the systems, 
there is a lot of um, a lot of politics and a lot of things, but we should really shouldn't look at it. I think we need to look at it, the fact that we can train people in Africa and they will be desirable in other parts of the world. That's the first thing. It's a positive thing. There are many professions whereby actually are not recognized. So that tells you something about our training. But we should actually not look at it as brain drain, but I look at it as brain circulation, really. And in that, especially in this virtual world today, um, we're contributing here to invest in South Africa, courtesy of, 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 of technology. And actually, it's useful. I don't see it that way. I see a lot of, for instance, um, here in, you know, in Cambridge and the UK, a lot of Chinese students who come, I know they go there, but they get a lot of skills that they take. And that's been one of the things that has helped China um, in that. So I don't see it as a negative thing. I think that manpower should circulate and not just within the continent. You know, Flavia was talking about having a regulation in the whole of Africa, starting with SADC, the regional block. Um, so yeah, so that's my take, really. I think the root of the problem is we need to develop our health system. Once we do that, people from other parts of the country, other parts of the world would come. Um, Aliko. Yeah, I think um, it's, it's a very fair challenge because I think it's sad when you look at the situation of things that a lot of us were trained and most of us in the hospital while we are trained, there is nobody there. I had lunch recently with my classmates from the same set. And when I look around, out, out of the 50 that were trained in ABU in the same class, 40 or so were outside the country. That's just in my set. But it's a complex issue, as Mark said, because you can simplify it into what pushes people away and what pulls people in. But the pushing is much more than that. There is a lot more that pushes people away. And you can look at it from individual factors. They were all Maslovian in nature. You have certain level of need that you need some um, security. I'm sure Salamatu and colleagues who are back home now in Kaduna will tell you that they are looking back always, thinking about their security. That's one, the issue of basic needs that you hear a doctor in the hospital has not been paid for many years. So I'm not trying to defend that. Yeah. But this is why I said the country itself, the political health, the health as a policy. Many people are leaving because they want to meet the basic needs that they want to meet. And coming back to the other point, I also agree with Mark. I think perhaps the way we see it, Prof, you started by saying we don't contribute back. There is a huge amount of brain circulation going in place. There is a huge amount of people that are spending time training and providing support from where we are at the moment, a huge amount. But I think there are some net benefits to the global sort of uh, work for global citizens. But there is, of course, the challenges there. And I think those are issues that will probably uh, leaders have to work on. The situation is getting worse as we speak in some countries now. Mm -hmm. And... Um, it's not a simple solution, but it's a worrying trend. Yeah, I wanted to come in, but before I answer the question on the brain drain, I wanted to just say that I've put, um, just to ease your, your mind, Prof Narula, that WHO is talking about the traditional medicine. And in fact, the strategy that I was talking about is out. So I've put a link to okay. anybody who's interested in those elements um, and how the regulation will occur. And I think this is the one that will be adopted for the different countries then to institutionalize in, you know, and make it more uh, appropriate for, for their countries. But I think one of the things, uh, Prof Navrula, Mark and Aliko, is that in fact you are contributing. Um, if I look at um, just today, it's a massive contribution to have this kind of conversation. Aliko and I work extensively on a number of programs 
which um, even just in our conversation, uh, you know, in terms of the work that we want to do, already galvanizes um, a set, set, certain set. And sometimes I think we don't have to look too far to governments and that. It's in our own spaces and in these little things to say, how do we work together? So I leverage a lot on um, and tap into um, Aliko's networks to say, listen, you know, in my new position now in Deputy Dean, we need this, we need this, can you please assist me and he's always ready and willing. So I think in a way, as we develop our human resource strategies, particularly for Africa, the diaspora uh, colleagues are going to be very important. I think for so long we've said, oh, they left the country. But, you know, for me, I think that we need to harness those skills. We need to use our telemates. And if we've got somebody like uh, Mark, who is there, he's a neurosurgeon, there's nothing wrong with him, tapping into being part of a, a ward round every a Friday, every uh, you know, month or whatever it is, and for him to be speaking in a grand ward rounds with our students on new technologies that they've developed um, or what he's using, uh, you know, in, in the UK. And he will also be able to learn from our uh, guys as well, where we have a massive disease burden um, in terms of how even in a resource constraint environment, you are able to do some of these surgical cases. So in my mind, I think it is a bonus that you do have um, colleagues in the diaspora but who are very much passionate about Africa. And I think it takes all of us first to intentionally work together. For instance, at the University of Pretoria, we have um, uh, going to be institution, what we're calling our African health strategy. And part of that is going back to our alumni who are in Canada, who are in the UK to say, listen, how are you going to contribute to the university? And what is your slice, even if it's to just mentor three or four students? So I think you uh, contributing massively even just by having conversations well thank you that that's uh you know obviously makes me feel better um and uh, um i but i i think that uh, in a, it's a very nice positive constructive way of of come drawing this uh, session to a close we do in a way we it kind of brings us to this i'm sorry we've neglected a question in the q a section by rafael and but I think that uh, I was typing it, but um, maybe I can say it if that would be quicker than just yeah. because I think it was a good question, Raphael. I think what I was referring to that is the right framework that will allow private sector engagement is starting at its core, the interest of the patient or the population. That means providing high quality care that can be make a difference. So that is at its core. But I think for a private sector to flourish within a very good partnership, there should be a framework that has some basic things in it. One, there has to be a regulatory framework that is robust enough to ensure that quality and standards are met for the care. Because as I said, most of what we found in some private providers, the quality is below what you expect. So a good quality assurance framework that is regulatory. The second one, I think, there should be a government regulatory environment that allow for a much more coordinated risk pooling arrangement, whether it's this insurance, social, however you see it, some insurance system, because any mechanism that allow for that is quite a good thing. The third one, I think, for private sector is what I have learned recently. If you have good access to capital, you can allow for that. So getting our banks, as the central bank seems to be doing now, to prioritize that and allow for businesses to access funds. I think that is quite a helpful one. But I also think that for a, for a continent where there is lack of workforce, and we have almost a quarter of the disease burden in the world, but less than 1% of the workforce, there should be some regulatory things that will allow market entry by private providers. I think training of healthcare workers has fundamentally been left to government for uh, many countries. I personally think private institutions should go into that. Sort of, and there is a huge return investment that can come from that. You can see in some medical school now, you can spend 20 years waiting to be a doctor because of several strikes. But we are seeing private institutions now that are taking five, six years to produce doctors, good quality ones. So I think those are frameworks that are worth exploration. And I think there are opportunities for everybody to benefit from that. 
So I hope I felt that gave a little bit of what you were asking. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And, you know, I think that this could go on and on. I believe we have one one thing I, I can definitely conclude is that the future is much more optimistic uh, than I had started off thinking at the beginning of this session. Uh, I feel that we there is a movement and it is a positive movement. Uh, I'm not sure whether we'll get to universal health care, but we certainly are edging to a better place. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, first of all, uh, for their time and uh, you know, coming to have this conversation and for our audience members. Uh, and uh, thank you for sitting through this. I just wanted to remind you that next month's session, November the 3rd, uh, we have a change of speaker. This of topic we are going to be talking is, is Africa on the brink of a global recession? What does this mean for different industries and different countries? Uh, and I'm hoping to see you on November the 3rd. Uh, so thank you, everybody, and have a good evening. Dunning Africa Center. It's not a place. It's a continent-wide conversation.